the origin story, Goat's Head Soup and the New Sound. So what is that origin story? Black music in the early 1970s was changing thanks to the sounds of Sly Stone, Isaac Hayes, George Clinton and Curtis Mayfield. The music, funk-driven and socially conscious, its focus on dance would branch off into disco, while its lyrical message and core rhythms would be a cornerstone in the birth of hip-hop. Is that all? Bands like the Allman Brothers and Leonard Skinner were also altering the sound of American rock, a trajectory that leads directly to Guns N' Roses. And there were the early stirrings of reggae with Jimmy Cliff, Toots and the Maytals and Bob Marley and the Wailers, emerging from Kingston, Jamaica. In the early 1970s, no major music critic foresaw this musical future. But as ever, musicians like the Stones were ahead of the game by being open to and experimenting with new sounds they were willing to bring to a mainstream audience. On the back of the 1972 American tour, Mick and Keith set out to capture this changing musical landscape in one record and making it their own with their signature sound. That unique blend of experimentation the band's bedrock sound is clearly evident on Goat's Head Soup. It's just that they didn't label their music as obsessively as their audience and music critics. After the early 60s, the Stones never stridently claimed allegiance to any particular musical movement. They made music that was driven by rhythm and grooves more commonly identified with black artists. With these influences at play and visa problems limiting their time in America, the Stones set off for Jamaica in late November of 1972 after Mick and Keith had spent some weeks writing in Keith's latest home in Switzerland. Following the recording of basic tracks in Kingston in November-December of 72, further work in LA and London in May and June of 1973, Goat's Head Soup was released in August after a delay due to Atlantic's unease over Star Star. On Goat's Head Soup, the Rolling Stones presented these new styles as mainstream pop music. The album met with a mixed reception. Audiences and critics weren't overly enthused with the change from R&B to dance grooves. This contrast is starkly shown by the first and last songs on the album. Star Star is the more famous of the two, On the surface for the sheer debauchery of its lyrics and it's much closer to their roots in the Chicago R&B scene. In contrast, Dancing with Mr. D with its dragging groove has largely been viewed as a disappointing opener compared to Sympathy for the Devil, Gimme Shelter and Brown Sugar. But on hearing recent remasters of Goat's Head Soup, it's clear that a lot of Mr. D's vibrancy was hidden underneath the murkiness of its original mix. Were there any new themes? When the album came out, critics did not highlight the Stones' take on social issues on songs like Heartbreaker, Hide Your Love and Angie. Instead, they talked up the drugs and the Jet Set lifestyle. This robbed Goat's Head Soup of a lot of its contemporary edge. Whether or not the Stones were the right voices to cast light on such social issues, the lyrics do show that they were aware of problems outside of their social orbit. That these things were minimised is perhaps due to the fact that black artists were more credible and powerful voices on those issues. It's notable that about a year after the release of Goat's Head Soup, Rolling Stone magazine would hail Stevie Wonder's Inner Visions album that had come out a week before Goat's Head Soup as great and visionary. The lead single was a ballad, Angie. This screams we're headed in a new direction to the music buying public, I think. The clues the Stones laid out weren't all that subtle. This totally messed with people's expectations at the time, but the single went straight in at number one in America. As decadent as the Stones got in the 1970s, Angie will always be the peak of that international jet-set, white suit, white brim, sun hat vibe for me. The album closer is one of the most controversial and filthy songs ever released. At its centre is this classic Stones guitar barroom brawl. Think respectable from some girls, but with everything cranked up to 11. Mick Taylor's rhythm chops on this alone should silence the doubters. Check out Joan Jett's version with or without Slash. For social commentary, Do Do Heartbreaker is as hard-hitting and musically exciting as Curtis Mayfield and Marvin Gaye's output of the period. Give it up for Billy Preston on keys. What's your favourite? A Hundred Years Ago is my favourite track on the record. It completes the reflective but unsentimental circle of Jagger songs which started with As Tears Go By. Taylor's two Wawa solos are expansive and world-destroying, yet melodically and emotionally focused. Goat's Head Soup's epic song is Winter, 
It has some of Jagger's finest lyric writing and Taylor's signature lead guitar genius written all over it. Keith's riff is as captivating yet distant, vividly evoking the melancholy in Jagger's lyrics. Sandwiched between the album's most conventional barroom R&B track, Hide Your Love, and its most experimental, Can You Hear the Music, Winter is a beautifully realised song of longing for a place the Stones can call home. The personal drama song is coming down again. While Keith was falling in love with Jamaica in 1972, he was clearly not experiencing domestic bliss. His missive slip my tongue in someone else's pie anticipates the more infamous domestic dramas of Fleetwood Mac on their classic album Rumours. Silver Train is a great Johnny Winter style slide blues workout. Forget glam rock, the Strains never gave up modernising their roots in Chicago blues. Probably the most experimental track on the album, Can You Hear the Music, seems an almost belated compositional nod to Brian Jones' love of world music. The instrumentation and rhythms are subtly arranged on Hear the Music, confirming the audacious, experimental ambition the Stones intended for Goat's Head Soup. The writing and the playing on this album are superb. I never bought the argument that somehow the Stones were burnt out or not focused when working on this material when in Kingston or London. Their tours of Australia and Europe of 1973 have remained some of their most highly acclaimed performances. Their standards were not dropping. With the addition of Billy Preston to their recording and touring band, which already included Nicky Hopkins, Bobby Keys and Jim Price, this was essentially the same group of musicians who'd been working together since 1969. As for Jimmy Miller, I'd say Mick and Keith utilised his talents to the hilt on this album. Its level of focus and verb are noticeably absent on the Glimmer Twins' own self-produced follow-up, It's Only Rock and Roll. The album is full of great production touches. A couple of my favourites are, the first half of Heartbreaker is sparse, drawing you into the outrage in Jagger's voice, before the horns close in with their own funky rage. Angie is a beautifully poised performance delicately balancing voice, acoustic guitar and piano. That catch in Jagger's whisper of Angie's name in the midsection delicately sets up the descending melodic line played by Nicky Hopkins before the strings wash poignantly over the whole track. Time and time again, I keep circling back to the same thought. Mick Jagger's singing on the range of this material is impressive. The decline, I'd say, came after Goat's Head Soup, not before. If you haven't checked this album out, give it a go. It rewards multiple listens. If you enjoyed the content in this video, give us a comment, a like and subscribe.